Hello, everyone. My name is Candice Thompson Zachary, and I'm the manager of Justice, Equity, and Inclusion at Dance Initiatives at Dance NYC. My pronouns are she, her, and I identify as a Black, non disabled woman of Caribbean heritage. I am wearing a lilac shirt uh, with a gold necklace. I have brown skin. My fro is pulled to the top of my head. Um, and I have small gold earrings on. My background is my living room, a white couch and brown floors that is slightly blurred because of the Zoom setting. Thank you for joining us for the Digital Town Hall, Arts and Cultural Workers for the New York Health Act. As we are at the mercy of technology, we want to remind you that there may be delays, sound issues and changing circumstances that may occur during our time together. We want to invite you to extend us and each other grace and patience. An ASL interpreter and closed captioning will be available throughout the entire event. There will be a few PowerPoint presentation whose information will be said orally by presenters in most cases, um, and the slides will be described. Feel free to post in the comment section on YouTube with questions or comments you may have for the panelists. We will be gathering them for the Q&A portion at the end and will present the most relevant questions that time will allow. If we don't get to your question, we will try to respond directly or via our follow-up email if possible. We hope that you can help us amplify today's conversation Repost, tag us, and share your takeaways on Twitter at DanceNYC, Instagram at Dance.NYC, and Facebook at Dance slash NYC using the, town, the hashtag DigiTownHall. Feel free to share the YouTube link to this conversation on your various feeds to have more arts workers join us for this important conversation. Before turning over to our conversation, please join me in thanking the strong team and our partners at Dance Arts National Collective, Abrams Arts Center, and the League of Independent Theater who are contributing to the Digital Town Hall today. For those new to Dance NYC, this organization delivers five core services for the field, advocacy, action-oriented research, leadership training, and convening, technological resources through our website and grant making to, empo to empower dance makers and cultural workers, create audiences and strengthen the collective voice for the art form. You can learn more about our programs on our website at dance.nyc. I will now go over our community guidelines for today and share our land acknowledgement. As we host, as we continue to host these conversations, we are learning how to navigate uh, digital spaces and create dialogue that reflects both our values as a team and organization. The guidelines below are a living commitment and may grow or change to reflect our learning as a staff, organization, and in relationship to you, our participants and beneficiaries. If you have suggestions or additions, please invite, we invite you to share them via the post event survey that we'll share at the end or via our email at info at dance.nyc. We ask that our audience agrees to the following directives. Upon participating in this event as a viewer or commenter, you are entering a virtual space of learning, reflection, respect, and accountability that is based on Dance NYC's value of justice, equity, and inclusion. This means that we agree to share our opinions, challenge perspectives, and engage or debate respectfully and acknowledge and course correct if harm is caused. We honor everyone's personhood and humanity, and we do not tolerate speech that is disparaging, abusive, violent, or that is intended to defame someone's character publicly. If anyone acts in violation of these guidelines, they will be either warned and asked to course correct or removed depending on the severity of the action. We thank you in advance for your collective agreement to these guidelines to ensure that our space remains generative for and respectful of our community. As a way of deepening our work and learning in racial justice, we regularly practice land acknowledgements at meetings and public convenings 
to recognize our country's violent history and its legacy in the space we occupy. This practice is currently under development with the guidance of indigenous dance artist and activist, Emily Johnson, to ensure that we embody this allyship. This includes taking actionable steps towards reparations in this initial instance by nurturing relationships with local indigenous and First Nations artists and organizations and making pathways for Lenape artists and leaders to return to Lenape hoking today. I would like to acknowledge that the city of New York is on stolen land, more specifically Lenape hoking, the unceded homeland of the Lenape people who are also recognized federally as the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma and a Darko, Oklahoma, the Delaware Tribe of Indians, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, the Stuck Bridge Muncie Community, Bowler, Wisconsin, and in Canada, the Muncie Delaware Nation, Moravian of the Thames First Nation, and the Delaware of Six Nations. The Lenape people are the original inhabitants and caretakers of this land and gave Manhattan Island its name. Manahatta, meaning hilly island or place where we go to gather the wood for the bows. Additionally, as we are gathered digitally and inspired by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show in what is currently called Canada, I invite us to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many rural indigenous communities that at times leave significant carbon footprints contributing to climate change that disproportionately impacts indigenous communities worldwide. We acknowledge that changing these inequities are our shared responsibility as are our roles in reconciliation, decolonization and allyship. We recognize that as an organization based in New York City, we have benefited and continue to benefit from the systemic displacement and subsequent erasure of Lenape people and governance on their land. Please join me in taking a moment to recognize and reflect on the centuries of violence, displacement, forced migration, and settlement here, as well as the centuries of resilience and leadership of all indigenous and First Nations peoples on Turtle Island that have led to our presence and livelihoods here today. Let's take a brief moment. Continuing our practice of recognition, we would like to name openly the legacies of the African slave trade, migration and immigration patterns, the disability rights and disability justice movements and the LGBTQ plus fight for justice. These areas and tactics of oppression through which white supremacy and settler colonialism have enacted and sustained its power over time are not the only areas, but rather the main focuses of dance and NYC's ongoing historical acknowledgement practice and justice, equity and inclusion strategy. We would also like to take a moment of silence in remembrance of the victims of COVID-19 around the world and to honor the unseen labor of the many people that continue to ensure the safety and well-being of our community in these trying times, including but not limited to frontline workers. We also acknowledge and mourn Ahmaud Armory, Jacob George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and more recently, Patrick Lynn Warren, Vincent Vinny Belmonte, and many Black people whose lives have been taken by the actions of white people, institutions, and systems, and the many accomplices, witnesses, and beneficiaries of white supremacy who have actively participated in and stood by, or stood by and observed in silence. We want to acknowledge the violence that has also occurred against the Asian and Asian American and Pacific Islander community, and that this has happened after a year of continuous xenophobia and systemic failures exacerbated by COVID-19. We remain firmly in support of the well-being and safety of our Asian American dance colleagues and continue to champion the role 
that dance can play to foster the inclusion, integration, and human rights in the New York City metropolitan area. We have witnessed as a nation and city the palpable impacts that this racism on the lives of Black, Indigenous people of color, immigrants, disabled and immunosuppressed people, LGBTQ plus people, people living in low income communities and poverty impacted by COVID-19. White supremacy continuously manifests itself in violence at the hands of law enforcement and in interpersonal interactions, our government's response to COVID-19 and our cultural institutions. Let's take a final moment of silence. Thank you. And now we'll begin our digital town hall, arts and cultural workers for the New York Health Act. COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the fragility of the healthcare system and the lack of a safety net for most arts workers. The New York Health Act, the state's version of Medicare for All, driven by single payer healthcare would measurably improve the lives of this group of workers more than nearly any other policy change. I'd like to welcome our event moderators, Rebecca Margulik and Garnet Henderson. Hi everyone, my name is Rebecca Margulik. I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently zooming in on Kumye land. I'm a non-disabled white woman with long dark brown hair. I'm wearing a black collared tank top dress. And my virtual background is blue with white text that reads Dance Artist National Collective. Hi everyone, my name is Garnet Henderson. I use she, her pronouns and am zooming in from Wappinger and Muncie Lenape lands. I'm a white non-disabled woman with long reddish blonde hair. I'm wearing a short sleeved red shirt, bright red lipstick, and my background is blue with white letters that say Dance Artists National Collective. Dance Artists National Collective, DANK for short, is a united group of dancers advocating for safe, equitable and sustainable working conditions for dancers in the US, especially those who are most impacted by systems of oppression. DANK works to empower dancers who are often underpaid, mistreated, manipulated, and misclassified by engaging in research, sharing resources, educating members, and organizing for collective action. The most recent Dance NYC COVID impact survey found that 21% of independent dance workers said that they have no health insurance. 35% said they were in need of access to mental health care and 44% said they had been unable to access needed medical and mental health resources. Unfortunately, these numbers are not surprising to those of us within the field, but they do highlight a clear need for health care and a clear lack of access to that health care within our community. What prompted uh, this town hall was through talking to friends and colleagues. After I first learned about the New York Health Act last year, I realized that many people were not aware of the New York Health Act bill and our chance to finally pass single payer health care here in New York State. This year is the first time we have a majority support in the state assembly and the state Senate. The New York Health Act would vastly improve our lives, especially as dance workers who risk our bodies and mental health in what is already a precarious industry. We want to live in a world where everyone can access the care they need. Garnet and I felt that a town hall specifically for the arts worker community was needed to raise awareness, to pass this historic legislation, and to hear directly from activists, legislators, and arts workers. We are so thrilled to have you all here. This evening, we are really excited to have with us Senator Gustavo Rivera, Yuling Ko Su from the Campaign for New York Health, Jay Bowie, a dance artist and founder of the Dance Union, 
dance worker Mario Ismail Espinoza, assembly member Farah Soufrant Forrest, Music Workers Alliance member Campbell Karshi, and actor, playwright, and organizer Jesse J. Hoon. Before we turn things over to our speakers, I wanted to take a moment to say thank you to Senator Rivera and Assemblymember Soufrant Forrest for all their incredibly hard work on this year's state budget. They fought really hard for a historic deal that taxes the rich and funds education, rental assistance, assistance for undocumented workers, arts organizations, and more. And we're really excited to add healthcare to that list. Just a friendly reminder to all of the speakers to please turn off their video when they're done speaking. And for our audience on YouTube, we encourage you to put questions in the YouTube live chat throughout the town hall, and we'll collect them for the Q&A. Um, keep that chat lively. We love the back and forth. And now I will pass it over to our first speaker of the evening, Senator Gustavo Rivera. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Gustavo Rivera, state senator for the 33rd district in the Northwest Bronx. Uh, I'm, I have to admit that this is the first time that I'm going to do this uh, as you are doing the, the introducing yourselves for, uh, for the folks who might have visual impairments. It is the first time that I'm doing so. So uh, I am in a white room uh, with some flags in the background. I am in my living room. I am a 45-year-old, uh, a great way to remind myself of my age, uh, light-skinned Latino man wearing a white shirt with a black tie and glasses and an attempt at a beard, which is just a goatee of sorts, as well as short hair while I'm usually fully shaved. That was not necessarily that pleasant an experience. Hey, it is what it is. Good evening to everyone. Um, I am also the, uh, so I'm the state senator for the 33rd district in the Bronx and also the chair of the health committee in the Senate and the main sponsor of the New York Health Act, which is the bill that we're talking about this evening. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I will be brief, particularly because I would love to get to your questions. Um, the New York Health Act is a piece of legislation which would create a single payer system in the state of New York, which would guarantee care to every single New Yorker. It would guarantee care regardless of your age, your wealth, your gender, your immigration status. It is a way, it is a way to actually simplify a system by making sure that everyone has access to the same healthcare system. Uh, it would be paid for by a graduated assessment, a payroll tax, a graduated assessment, meaning based on your ability to pay. Uh, studies tell us that over, that about 95% of New Yorkers would pay less in healthcare than they do now because they would not pay premiums. They would not pay co-pays, out of pocket costs or out of network costs. It would include long-term care which is, is something that currently is not, uh, is not guaranteed in other, uh, in other systems. And ultimately what it would do is it would move us to a place where we can treat healthcare as what it is, a human right that everyone should have access to. I look forward to answering any of your questions that you might have, uh, but most importantly, I look forward to the support that we would get from you folks, since I believe that this is a day, that this is a year in which we can actually achieve it. So I thank you for your invitation this evening and I look forward to any and all of you for questions. Thank you. This is Garnet speaking. Um, I'm gonna jump in with a question for Senator Rivera here. Um, many people in our community- Oh. <laughs> Hello. Um, many people in our community, because unfortunately dance does not pay well, many people in our community are on Medicaid or now the essential plan, which is kind of a bridge between Medicaid and subsidized health plans on the exchanges here in New York. So I would love to hear you talk a bit about how universal health care would be different from how Medicaid works now. I know it's similar in many ways, but why 
why would that be a better system for people who are currently on Medicaid or on the essential plan? Well, the first thing that would be uh, the, that we have to that we have to know is that the system would be the same one for everyone. Uh, right now, we have a system which is a multi-payer system, which means that whether you are, if you're a Medicaid patient, you have Medicare, you have private insurance, you have no insurance. There's all these different ways to pay for healthcare, uh, and in, and healthcare institutions kind of uh, rely on their um, uh, on, on the fact that they get private payers to be able to kind of make up for the lower payments that they get with Medicaid. What we're talking about is that in all of these cases, what individuals have is insurance, uh, whether it's publicly funded insurance like Medicaid or privately funded insurance like you would potentially get from an employer or from your own payment. Insurance does not guarantee you care. Insurance just guarantees that you have maybe a card in your pocket and uh, a, a way to say, hey, maybe I have access to care. But part of the insurance process is to actually deny you care so that insurance companies can keep most of their money. As it relates to Medicaid, the important thing is that right, and right now, Medicaid rates are quite low. Medicaid rates are set by the state and Medicaid is paid jointly with federal and state money. What we're saying is that the rates that would be, and, and by the way, that means that there are a lot of providers who do not take Medicaid patients because they know that they will get paid much less. So having the, the New York Health Act go into effect, there's a part of the bill that specifically states, and it would be in statute, that the cost of that the actual um, rates of payment for the services would be in corresponding, correspond to how much the care actually costs to provide. That would mean that if right now Medicaid is over here, and I'm for those that are visually impaired, I'm doing a little sign where, uh, uh, like under my face, let's say, that's under my face is where the payments for Medicaid would be. And then I would put the finger above my head to say this is where the private insurance would be. And Medicare would be a little bit below halfway how about we raise it a little bit above Medicare for everything, for every single payment? That means that institutions like St. Barnabas Hospital, which is in my district, and in which 90% of people that go there are Medicaid patients, will see the revenue that they get go way up. Therefore, the institution will be more financially secure. So you would have all healthcare covered uh, anything that is medically necessary and decided by you and your physician that is medically necessary would be paid for. And providers don't have to, would not have to worry about getting paid a pittance for the work that they do. So those are some of the differences. Thank you, Senator. I have uh, one question from the chat from Ann Chiavarini. She asked, with the New York State budget now passed, what is the strategy now to pass funding for the New York Health Act? Funny you ask. And thank you for thanking us uh, for the budget. Uh, this was a historic document. And as someone who's been in the state Senate for 11 years, I can tell you it is the most uh, progressive budget that I've ever voted on. And there is a lot in there that we can be immensely proud of. Um, so now that we're done with that, the focus that we're, many of us are going to put our, our, all of our energy into is trying to move the New York Health Act this year. Um, I will tell you that it is both complicated from a technical standpoint as well as a political standpoint. There are big interests, namely insurance companies, as well as big private hospitals that do not want for this to go into effect. Uh, they we are going to disrupt. We purposely want to disrupt their business model. Uh, and we want to make sure that we provide people health care because they're human, not because they're wealthy or because they have the right type of insurance. So the goal is going to be is, is going to be difficult, but I can tell you we have out of the 63 members of the New York State Senate, Senate, 33 of them are um are, are now co-sponsors of the bill. So that is the majority of the New York State Senate. I forget the number of assembly members, but it is above 80, maybe 90 people in the Senate. Uh, 82, 
82 uh, members of the New York State Assembly. So we have the majority of the New York State legislature. Now we have to, and this is where you folks come in, by connecting with the with the elected officials that represent you either in the Senate or the Assembly. If they are not supporters, then ask them to be supporters. But if they are sponsors of the bill, then ask them to make it a priority for them, right? Because they can make it, a, because it is a priority for their constituents. And we have to bring the pressure to the leadership to let them know that it is something that is important for the majority of the conference, both in the Senate and the Assembly, so that it becomes a priority of the entire conference. So this is what we're doing now. We are organizing to put pressure and say, this is something that needs to happen. And as you said at the beginning, if, some, if this pandemic taught us something, it taught us how essential it is to treat healthcare as a human right and not something that you should have only if you have enough money in your pocket. And for the record, it was the lady that just popped up on your screen who actually told me about the 82. She said she was she wrote it in the in the chat. She's like 82. And there, and there she is, smarter than I am. Yuling. Hey everybody. Thanks, Senator Rivera. Nice to see y'all. Um, so my name is Yuling Koshu. I use she or they pronouns. I'm currently on the land of the Muncie Lenape and Canarsie nations, colonized as Brooklyn, New York City. I'm a non-disabled Taiwanese American child of immigrants. I'm wearing a, a light denim button up shirt, small gold earrings in my ears and have black hair put up in a bun. Um, my background is a wall of signs and patches with various uh, social justice messages. On this slide, I'm with my co-director of the Campaign for New York Health, uh, Ursula Rosen, who's based on Haudenosaunee land colonized as Syracuse, New York. And we are part of, uh, we also are part of the New York State Poor People's Campaign Coordinating Committee. Um, so this graph here shows that the US spends twice as much money on healthcare than every other industrialized country. And it's not because we provide more or better care. In fact, we die younger, more of our babies die and more of our mothers die and so many other worse outcomes. Um, many of our healthcare workers also are living in poverty. So the money is not going to them either as this bar graph shows. So where is the money going? Well, we, we know that some of our money, at least 30% of our money, as this flyer shows, 30% um, of our health insurance premiums go towards CEO, millionaire, billionaire salaries who are making at least $100,000 a day. Um, it goes to marketing and it goes to administrative bloat. And COVID, on top of all of the pre-existing health inequities from before COVID, um, we especially see that healthcare should never be tied to employment. The headlines on this slide show you know, like significant numbers of unemployed because of the pandemic. And these are early, these are, these are from earlier in the year. And then a banner that says uh, COVID pandemic, no work, no income, no insurance, hashtag pass on my health, hashtag cancel rent and a stop police brutality sign next to it. This slide has headlines from a variety of media that shows, you know, while we're suffering, we're dying, we're being impoverished, um, we have anxiety, uh, during this pandemic, the rich keep getting richer and in fact are making record profits during COVID, including health insurance companies who are making record profits by denying care during a pandemic, and also companies that are suing patients for medical debt during a pandemic. Um, and Senator Rivera went over a lot of the great, um, the, the basics of the bill. So just to say here that the New York Health Act is based on human rights principles, and that was very intentional. Um, that it covers everything that Medicaid, Medicare, and any state employee insurance package includes, um, that at least 90% of New Yorkers will see substantial savings in their spending for health care, and that's both right and left economic studies show that. And so no longer do we need to see family or friends in situations where they're bound to bad relationships or tolerating unhealthy work lives just because they need the health insurance. No longer do we have to let our bodies deteriorate because we need to pay rent instead of getting the care we need. Um, no longer do we need to refuse a 10 cent raise uh, just because uh, it'll kick us off of our Medicaid. 
And as Senator Rivera mentioned, I want to highlight also that it includes long-term care. And because not only do we need the care for long-term care, but we want to deinstitutionalize patients. We want to create a caring economy where there's equitable compensation for patient care, for home care, for patient care in nursing homes and hospitals. And these photos here on this slide are just some of the really fierce advocates, all most directly impacted by long-term care, who brought to our attention um, several years ago that we can't have guaranteed universal health care without long-term care included. And so we were able to discuss and develop together um, how to make the New York Health Act even better to include long-term care and also um, to save money still. And the New York Health Act means that we have money for beds and PPE instead of 1600 billing clerks um, as Duke Medical Center has here in this slide. Uh, no longer spending $99,000 just on navigating hundreds of insurance company bureaucracy to get one doctor reimbursed for services. Um, and what I really want to get to is that the New York Health Act is more than just health policy. So racism, racism works to fracture and scatter families and communities. This is a quote from Dr. Rhea Boyd a pediatrician and public health advocate based in Oakland, California. And the fragmented system of for-profit health insurance is one of the most significant structures that upholds and enables this kind of white supremacy. And the New York Health Act helps dismantle and transform our healthcare structure to be more equitable, to be a caring economy. The New York Health Act is about wealth redistribution. It's about eliminating a root source of wealth extraction. Private health insurance companies and real estate profiteers are intentionally and relentlessly extracting wealth from us and especially from our most marginalized communities. Um, I will skip. Uh, Dr. Rhea Boyd also emphasizes that health inequities are when certain populations are made vulnerable, often through inequitable distribution of protections and supports. And so that's why we push so hard for the New York Health Act um, because it changes the distribution and protection and supports to be more equitable. Um, and to put it very clearly, we can't have racial and economic justice without single payer. This chart here shows medical conditions that shorten black lives. And what is most infuriating about it is that the majority of them are situations that could have been prevented if we had universal guaranteed health care. Um, I'll skip over that. So what I'm excited to share and what, what Senator Rivera shared actually, we now have, we made history in March. We reintroduced with um, majority support of both the assembly members and Senate members. Um, and so now what? <laughs> we, we want the New York Health Act. It, it must be a part of a just pandemic recovery for New York. So we need everyone in this room. And that's, that's what the campaign for New York Health is here for. Um, we are a statewide coalition from North Country to Buffalo, to Troy, to Elmira, to the Hudson Valley, to the east end of Long Island and the boroughs of New York City. We have nurses and in fact, they're leading the way, especially New York State Nurses Association and 1199, two of the largest healthcare worker unions in the state. We have physicians, med students, social workers, home care workers and other healthcare workers with us. More than 500 businesses, worker cooperatives, and freelancers statewide are in support of guaranteed health care for all. We have faith leaders. We have electeds on board. Um, we have hundreds of political grassroots service and community organizations and unions statewide as well. Millions of New Yorkers and also folks nationwide in the Medicare for All movement want to see New York State make health care a human right. Um, and I'm going to skip over this for now. These are, we have remote teams. We want you to join them. We want you to submit memos of support. We want you to contact your legislator. Um, and we want you to participate in upcoming weeks of action. There, we have eight weeks left in the legislative session to pass the New York Health Act. So we're going to be relentless and, and be showing up every week. But what I want to get to is that most importantly, our work is rooted in our stories. We win with the power of our stories. We win with the power of a mass movement. We win by working collectively and in coordination. And so I want to switch to a video here.
And this video, I apologize, does not have subtitles, just to um, warn the captioners and interpreters. I was um, standing at my pharmacy, um, waiting for my prescription, and the pharmacist came back to me and said, that's gonna be $850. You just pray you don't get so incapacitated that you can't work. I mean, wonder where my next pair of glasses comes from, when my next trip to the dentist is going to come from, or God forbid something terrible happens. I mean, then what happens? In the last few years, I was diagnosed with Hashimoto's disease, which is a thyroid condition. So I'm on medication, and I have to be on medication pretty much forever. But that's currently done through my workplace. So what happens if my workplace no longer needs me? My name is Juan Peralta. I was born and raised in Harlem, New York City. It's either go to the doctor or pay my bills or pay my rent. My name is Matilda. I can use they, them pronouns and I'm going deaf. I have been unable even with um, my Medicaid to fix my ears. Hi, well, I'm Belkis. Um, my daughter, actually, she needed some treatment because um, she suffers from anxiety and depression. They didn't want to pay for her therapy sessions. They said that was too much money. I was very um, worried about not, you know, getting that for her. The experience of trying to access medical care and not being able to get it was really upsetting. And I hesitate, like I put off getting preventative care now because I don't want to deal with those people. It was, um, it was hurtful. I feel like that's like a big question. Um, if we had good med like uh, a good medical system, um, which includes like mental health services, maybe like my uncle wouldn't have died from alcoholism. Maybe my grandmother would have like, gotten better service and maybe she would have lived longer. She died in her fifties. Maybe I would check up on myself more often because it wouldn't be like a $50, $100 out of my pocket just to like make sure that I'm doing well. I cannot tell you how we're powerless when we're isolated. We need to know our stories aren't just our own. We need to have confidence and comfort that we'll keep each other safe as we uh, risk our bodies against forces that don't really see us, hear us acknowledge us we aren't human to them but we're human to each other if we have a movement we have to um so that was done in, in collaboration with the new york state poor people's campaign and i will end with just you know we don't want our health care to be based on uh, a democratic party or any party uh, it, or what political party I'm a part of, we want it to be based on our needs. And so that's why we are building this mass movement and unity across differences in order for health justice to be realized and sustainable um, and with the New York Health Act. And so the stories, they can be translated into um, stories to advocate for our needs. And that can look like a simple sign selfie with or a pre-printed sign, or when you write out your story, as you see in these photos, it can be simple written words turned into quote graphics or illustrations in a zine or an audio file file, um, a letter to the editor or an op-ed, we can help write it and place it. We can get legislators and other influencers to collaborate on them. Uh, we build a leaderful movement by understanding our own story, coaching others to understand their story, and to share them at speakouts, events, press conferences with the media. Um, we do them at public hearings, and we collaborate on storytelling trainings um, and video stories. And so I hope tonight after this amazing event, you'll spend some time to jot down some thoughts, stream of consciousness about your healthcare story. Um, suggest aiming for a two minute healthcare story, hone it over the next week, develop it, and then bring your story, whatever stage it's at, to a recording session on Wednesday the 21st um, from 6 p.m. to 17. And the organizers who put this event together will be there as will I to work on and record your healthcare story right there in the Zoom meeting. Thanks so much. Hello, hello. Hi, my name is Jay Bowie. Um, I'm going to pull like a Jamal Barnes, if you know who Jamal Barnes is, and invite us to take a breath. 
um, hearing the number three. So I'll say three breaths and then I will introduce myself more fully. Ground yourself in whatever position you are in. Just take an opportunity to tune into your body and into your heart. Feel it beat independently of your own thoughts and intentions. And then bring your attention to your breath. Do not judge it, only notice it. Notice where in your body your breath expands through your chest, your belly, your ribs or your lower back. And let's start our first inhale together. Inhale. Exhale. In. Deflate. Last time, inhale. And deflate. So my name is Jay Bowie. I am a Black, um, described male at birth, dancer, artist, human, spirit. Um, I'm wearing gold rimmed glasses, a red bandana. I'm also um, wearing a gold septum ring in my nose. I have copper, I have a copper wrapped um, earring on my right ear and a copper wrapped necklace, as well as a second necklace that is made of wooden shells. Um, I'm wearing a navy t-shirt and I am sitting in a black chair in front of white doors. Um, I'm on stolen Lenape land, also colonized to name Brooklyn, bed specifically. I am also, um, I'm also a, a gender person, so I use they, them pronouns. I think that's, those are most of my introductions. Um, I come to you today with my mental health as like a major identity, um, especially in relationship to New York Health Act here. <laughs> um, I just did a little research while the other speakers were going and um, I always encourage every artist and every person to do some research in the moment. If, it, if you have some questions that Google can answer and one question that Google answered is how does New York Health, how does the New York Health Act um, impact mental health? Um, before I get into the details of that, I just want to reaffirm that we all have a mental health that needs to be managed, taken care of and looked after just as our body has a health to be managed, looked after and taken care of. And more importantly, as dance artists, our mental capacity that the container for mental health lies within our bodies. So as we continue to make art and move and, and change the world with the training and the techniques we used to manipulate this body and form, it's really important that we take care of our mental health as well. That's something that in some way still feels like a disconnect as a culture in our field. And I'm really looking forward to the New York Health Act to help change that. One of the major things is that, as we know, most of our field is freelance dancers. Um, even if we're dancing with the company, our protections and um, benefits still model that after freelance artists. So without any kind of real mental health care, it becomes a major challenge to actually look for mental health. I mean, look for a therapist, <laughs> look for someone to take care of it. One thing I've experienced is that while I'm battling with depression or anxiety or suicidal ideation, um, and I'm looking for a therapist, I'm often being um, met with the fact that they do not take my Medicaid insurance. So the tens to sometimes nearing about a hundred different inquiries, most of them coming up short because they do not take the mental, they do not take the healthcare that I already have. Hearing that the New York Health Act is going to bring that amount of money that those therapists will make from caring for me with their expertise means that there's a more likelihood that my mental health and our mental health can be actually attended to by therapists. And there might be even more of an inclination within the market for us to be taken care of. That revolutionizes our dance world and also can give us more of a fight and actually more of a um, impetus to change our culture, to value mental health at the center along with our bodies. 
Uh, there might be questions at the end, so we can talk about that at the end, but I'll just go ahead and pass on over to Mario now. Thanks, Jay. I appreciate that. And I particularly appreciate the grounding. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mario Ismael Espinosa. Um, I use the they, them, they. I usually rush through when I speak, but I'm going to try to breathe like I was just encouraged to. Uh, I'm a Mexican immigrant with invisible disabilities and currently able-bodied, um, currently sheltering in place with my family in the land of the Kumeyaay people, which is also the land of my birth. Um, the Kumeyaay territory is divided by the international border and it's currently called San Diego and Tijuana. Um, for those listening with visual disabilities, I am light brown skinned Mexican with some would say Mediterranean features. Um, I have about shoulder length hair, curly, black rimmed glasses, uh, septum hoops, and um, gold earrings. And behind me is bur blurred. Um, <sighs> I'm here um, speaking as a dancer. Uh, I'm a social worker now, but as a dancer that is currently finding their voice, um, of course I'm not here to speak on behalf of anyone, but I do believe that my lived experience is similar to many other dancers. Um, as a dancer, I was trained to be quiet, right? I was trained to express my body, express myself with my body, but never really use my voice. My opinion was never required or welcomed. And I learned that really well. In fact, I learned to be quiet so well that I internalized this silencing and and this resulted in me not speaking up on behalf of what I deserved and what I'm entitled to for the mere fact of being a valued member of society. Um, I don't think I need to tell anybody here that dancers are the lowest paid in the performing arts industry. And our episodic work makes it really hard, sometimes impossible to get health insurance, which results in leaving injuries, both emotional and physical untreated. Um, we dance with broken bodies, injured, pulled muscles, broken toenails. I mean, the list gets really ugly. Um, and yeah, when I was dancing, I had the privilege of dancing with a unionized dance company. Um, and that was at the end of my career, which meant that working for a unionized dance company, my employer was required to provide health insurance. And, um, and even though my work was episodic, I had full year, uh, year round health insurance, which meant that I could see physical therapists, get x-rays, get MRIs if I was injured. Um, and I also had health benefits, which means that I could see a therapist on a weekly basis without having to pay out of pocket or meet outrageous deductibles. And I know that that's a privilege because I know many dancers don't have that. And I know that many dancers have to have many several jobs, I should say, several jobs to live in New York City. And we all moved to New York City because it is a hub for the performing arts. And without the performing arts, New York City would not be the city that it is. Um, and so in my mind, that makes performing artists, specifically dancers, valuable members of society, but really essential workers. Um, and thus, in a time of COVID, we deserve to have this life-saving resource. Um, yeah, uh, like Senator Gustavo Rivera said, this is this here is a human rights and we all deserve affordable health healthcare. Um, and I don't wanna take any more time. I think that's all that I wanna share. I think uh, right now I'm gonna pass it over to assembly member Sufrat Forrest. Uh, yeah, Sufran Forrest. So if Sufran wants to come forward. We're going to take another second to pull up the camera. Or I can just tell you more about myself and what I do now. I can do that too. So um, I, I'm here speaking as a dancer and now I'm currently a social worker. And I wanted to start 
talking about my experience as a dancer because I think that that really informs my work as a social worker. And I work right now with other artists and the work that I do with other artists really reinforces that notion that, you know, performing artists need support. And now I see that Farah is here. Farah, did I say that? Did I pronounce it correctly? Okay, cool. Okay. So thank you so much, Mario. Um, no action. Um, my name is Farah Sufran Flores, uh, she, her pronouns, and I am the assembly woman for District 57. Um, currently standing on stolen Native American land. I don't know which tribe, so I'm learning along the way. Uh, I think it's Lenapo, I think, yeah. Definitely not Canarsie, but maybe Lenapo. Um, I have Grand Army Plaza background um, in my visual. I am a Black Haitian American female. Um, and I'm wearing a leopard dress and the camera can't show it, but there's a big little belly down here because I'm soon to be mommy to a baby boy, black boy coming soon. And um, I wear glasses, so I guess I am visually impaired as well. And so I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about why as a nurse and a state legislator, it is very important to have a piece of um, document called the New York Health Act passed through so that way we get to back, because I say back because we're not um, currently there, but we get to the point of installing humanity and justice into our society. So my question for you, and I'm gonna leave question open time for questions for me, is where does health start, right? Um, as a nurse, I know that health starts um, right as you pop out the womb. And it's not um, because you start breathing, it's because literally, your health starts based on the environment around you, whether you had breast milk or um, immunization, you got the immunizations on schedule. It depends on your mom's health or the health of your home, the health of the schools that you eventually go to, the workplaces that you go to. So when we talk about what is exactly and understanding social determinants of health, health is based on where you're at. And so as a legislator, it is very important for me to create or assist to create a space that promotes positive health. Um, one of the tools that we use as um, in nursing is literally this social health tool where I'm going to ask you, do you have housing? Do you have adequate childcare, unemployment? How's your finances? Do you have um, someone beating on you? Are you being sexually trafficked, human trafficking? Can you pay your bills? Because all of this affects your health, your mental health, your spiritual health, your body health, you know? And so I, in the assembly, um, use my position to ask legislators, are we providing the environment for health? And so if we know that there are barriers to health, we need to eliminate it. And one of the things is the New York Health Act, it equalizes the game because it forces us to ask these very important questions to determine the social, um, to the, the social environment, the economic environment around our patients. Because once we recognize that, we eliminate it and we make it accessible to all. And this is the goal of the New York Health Act, to provide a clean environment so that your health can be optimized to the level um, that it needs to be in. So leave that room for questions at the end and I'll be around. Thank you everyone.
We have one question that was asked earlier, and I think this would be a great one to ask you. Um, someone asked, will this act at the state level help to ensure that healthcare workers are compensated with livable wages? We deserve quality care. They deserve quality livelihoods as they administer it. Well, when we look at the hospitals being the way the way we the, our system is right now, and um, many other speakers talked about this, it is very much profit driven. In a capitalist society with a profit driven healthcare um, system, it is the extraction that is prioritized. Right? Um, how much can we get out of this, including not only patient. Uh, care, um, but also the insurance companies, the doctors working, the nurses working, how much can we get out of this to serve our investors? Because again, that's what profits driven system does. And so when we have a New York Health Act, where it's no longer profit driven, but rather follows the health trends of um, a neighborhood. And it follows the idea of um, not necessarily reimbursement, but the investment, we put it up front, then it changes how we calculate numbers, right? The nurse is no longer something that we try to extract we must invest in the nurse. We must invest in the doctor. We must invest in the personnel that surround these healthcare workers. And in then we've created a system where we, um, we, we cherish our most prized capital, which is the people, right? Um, because when we have nurses that feel like they are the center of the care, um, and then nurses are providing direct care to patients, they are able to impart that to the patient as well as their guide to how they provide that care. So I think that the New York Health Act is very instrumental to something like safe staffing, right? Say initiating safe staffing ratios, um, because you cannot have a system like this where you are nickel and diming um, not only the amount of nurses on the floor, but then how much are we going to compensate those nurses for, for providing the very center of um, what the system is based on? Care, basically. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Uh, my name is Campbell Charshi, uh, aka Campbellicated. I use uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I am currently on the land of the Muncie Lenape uh, in what is now uh, referred to as West New York, New Jersey. Uh, I am a non-disabled uh, white man managing a chronic condition. Uh, I'm wearing a black shirt, olive green jacket, and a blue circuit board pattern bandana. My background is my closet. So uh, Camblicated is my alter ego. He's a cyborg who battles insulin cartels in the not so distant future. I'm also a music worker here on behalf of the Music Workers Alliance. Thanks very much to Dank for having me. My bionic nature is not just for, for show. A port uh, implanted into my chest at age six allowed me to successfully battle leukemia and I've been wearing an insulin pump since 2003. Um, I should be even more wired up, but I can't afford my continuous glucose monitoring sensors, which cost $600 a week for a five week supply. At least I'm not rationing insulin yet. I feel incredibly fortunate and privileged to be able to perform, teach, and compose and produce here in the New York area. But I, along with many other artists managing chronic conditions, struggle with medical insecurity 
as a result of others' pursuit of profit. We lead needlessly precarious lives. An old adage tossed around the Music Workers Alliance is that music work is one of the few kinds of work where you find yourself unemployed at the end of every evening. MWA formed to go to bat for those musicians, uh, DJs, producers, uh, composers, arrangers, session players, music therapists, uh, recording engineers, and many others whose work is not protected by traditional collective bargaining agreements. Uh, the quote unquote independent artist, or more accurately, the exploited artist, is the creator of the vast majority of musical content consumed today. Most non-white or non-European musical genres also fall into this dubious category. Uh, the passage of the Affordable Care Act is what allowed me uh, to pursue this line of work at all. It guaranteed me health insurance coverage despite my pre-existing conditions and despite my lack of employer provided benefits. I'm very grateful for this. But uh, as many on this panel can attest, ACA marketplace policies ensure that those battling injury or illness lead second class lives and are subjected to diminishing health outcomes. Here is a study I published with the healthcare activists of four years of my health coverage on the ACA between 2014 and 2017. I'm gonna drop it in the, in the YouTube chat right now. Um, so I've been in the trenches for a long time uh, teaching affluent children five days a week and taking absolutely every gig, all to meet my exorbitant cost of living, which is not a metaphor. I haven't rationed insulin, but will routinely stretch out three month supplies of other medical equipment to last a year or more. Doctors visits have been routinely delayed um, and I've spent hundreds of hours on the phone um, trying to get the, to the bottom of various medical bills. In the past couple of years, uh, I've added medical rights organizing to my already busy schedule in the hope that younger artists and future generations dealing with complex illnesses may never know how it feels to be farmed by the medical industrial complex. Valued just enough to allow me to continue working and pay paying premiums at less than full health. And while I'm engaged uh, in a national campaign uh, to pass the Medicare for All Act of 21 uh, with my North New Jersey uh, DSA chapter, I feel that uh, New York State has a unique opportunity to establish public health insurance in the near future with the New York Health Act, a move that could jumpstart a sweeping movement for health equity across the nation. Such a policy would transform the lives of millions of people and would ensure that a career in music and the arts are not out of bounds for those managing chronic conditions. But Camplicated can play it better than I can say it. Here he is in his element, grinding it out in the battle for medical justice, along with a coalition of many other patients, health workers, artists, gig workers, independent contractors, employees, friends, and family. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for having me. I'm going to drop a, a music video that I made uh, with Camplicated uh, in the chats. Um, and I think that uh, I'm really ex we're really excited to see what uh, you all uh, do in New York. I'm, I'm looking forward to helping out, uh, organizing, and learning uh, from everyone here uh, in any way that I can. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jesse J. Hoon, uh, pronouns he, him, his. Uh, I'm currently on the land of the Munsi Lenape, Wappinger, and Canarsi, which is now Astoria, Queens. Uh, I am a non-disabled Asian man of Korean heritage. I'm wearing a dark blue denim button-up and a maroon t-shirt and a pair of square glasses. Uh, my background is my bedroom with a bookshelf and a uh, Bertie Sanders poster and a little blue box that's, that's the TARDIS from Doctor Who. Um, I'm a playwright, actor, and organizer currently organizing with NYC DSA and Workers Arts Project. I also work with Maggie Theatre Company and I'm a graduate student at CUNY Hunter College. 
So working in theater, you periodically receive a lot of emails about our industry telling you about what unprecedented times these are. Millions unemployed, millions losing their health insurance. The truth of the matter is for theater workers and workers all over the country, there has always been a precedent for these crises because the crisis of American healthcare never stops. As the American theater and the arts as a whole face a reckoning in response to its exploitative and discriminatory structures, the question of healthcare should be at the front of everybody's minds. Because a great deal of the arts workers are non-union freelancers, private health insurance has made navigating the arts for its workers nearly impossible. It prevents marginalized people from entering the industry. It forces theater workers to work often several abusive, exploitative day jobs in order to even consider pursuing their craft. It asks artists to choose between the work they create and the stability they deserve. It places an often exorbitant price tag on essential and necessary care for arts workers, physical therapy, mental health, dental care. Our current healthcare system makes theater workers live at the mercy of greedy private companies who profit from our illnesses. It exhausts the mind, body, and soul. So for a few examples, front of house workers at prominent theaters in the state are asked to be on their feet for hours at a time for minimal wages, their minds operating at maximum capacity. I've done this for at least three major theater companies. Because they're considered part-time freelancers, front of house workers receive no employer health benefits and have to rely on the patchwork Obamacare marketplace, facing high premiums and deductibles and many essential services not being covered. Members of unions like Actors' Equity, who now must make up weeks or even months of approved work to receive the financial aid with health insurance they were promised, are feeling the direct consequences of a healthcare system that prioritizes the profits of a handful of CEOs and shareholders at the expense of working people. Under private health insurance, the life of an arts worker is defined by fear, fear of unemployment, fear of permanent physical and mental damage, fear of instability. The New York Health Act would allow freelance artists more freedom to pursue their craft, to get the care they need to look after their instruments and minds, to be able to move from different projects without having to worry about losing access to their doctors. It would allow unionized workers to negotiate for higher wages, for shorter hours, for more money into their pensions. When we provide healthcare free at the point of service as a human right, regardless of income or immigration status, arts workers can be driven by creativity and passion and less by, by precarity and fear. A better world is not only possible, it is necessary. And that's why we must organize our communities and mobilize our fellow arts workers to ensure that not one more person has to suffer harm because they can't afford health insurance. We must pass the New York Health Act. For those actors and stage managers who are members of Actors Equity, or for those who know Actors Equity members, I strongly recommend becoming involved with AEA for single payer, who are fighting to make the equity leadership com commit to pushing for legislation like the New York Health Act and Medicare for All. I also recommend joining the NYC DSA Healthcare Working Group and their week of action for the New York Health Act, which will involve canvases, phone banks, and COVID safe community events all next week, April 12th through 18th. I also recommend joining Workers Arts Project, a new group dedicated to organizing unemployed and underemployed arts workers. Let's be clear, we are going up against a well-oiled machine armed to the teeth with endless money being funneled into negative ad campaigns and campaign coffers in both major parties. But if we stand together and organize our communities, if we're willing to take on the private health insurance industry and their allies within the arts industry le leadership and our state government, if we stand together, we can accomplish something truly unprecedented. Thank you. Wow, thank you to those incredible speakers. Um, we're gonna have a Q&A with them in just a few minutes. We're gonna ask all the wonderful questions you've been putting in the chat. But right now, we're actually gonna take a moment of collective direct action. We know it can be tough to find time to pick up the phone and call your elected officials. So Rebecca and I are actually gonna do that right now. And we are inviting you to join us. So we're gonna drop a link from Campaign for New York Health into the chat. It makes it really easy to find your elected officials, call them and get a script to use all in one place. So I'm gonna mute myself and do that right now. And I am inviting you to join me. 
If you have time uh, during this brief period, we're asking folks to also call Governor Cuomo. I will share a slide with a script um, similar to the one you will see in the link that you're going to get uh, and with his number and I'll share it now and then read it out loud. So we have the link, it's the same link in the chat. Um, for Cuomo, uh, the number is 518-474-8390. Basic script, feel free to personalize it. Dear Governor Cuomo, my name is, your name, the ongoing coronavirus pandemic is exposing the weakness in our healthcare system. We need to create a system that guarantees healthcare for everybody, regardless of race, age, immigration, or employment status. As a constituent, I am writing to ask you to co-sponsor the New York Health Act, the legislation that will finally bring universal guaranteed healthcare to New York State. I personally would benefit greatly from the passing of this bill. You can add something like, if passed, the New York Health Act will implement truly universal health care, including long-term care, and eliminate financial barriers to care while allowing people to go to the doctor and hospital of their choice. Um, you can end with something like, as the governor, I hope you will be a leader on this important issue. You have said you support single-payer health care. Why don't you support it in your own state? Thank you for your time and you can say your name. I will stop the screen and then put that number in the chat as well. I'm gonna mute myself and call my reps.
I hope the the link worked for everyone. I know we're having maybe some issues in the YouTube live chat. Um, and so we're going to now move on to a Q&A portion. Um, so we've received some questions throughout uh, and we're, we are gonna ask, uh, we'll, we'll, depending on, we'll direct them to whoever. Um, so give us one second. I'm just gonna start gathering questions. Please share your experience of calling in the YouTube live chat and feel free to continue to post questions in the chat. I'll jump in for a question uh, with a question for you, Ling. Um, a few of our speakers referenced this, but I would love it if you could say a little bit more, Yuling, about why it's worth it to fight for single payer healthcare on the state level right now. Hey, thank you. Um, well, we, the Campaign for New York Health, um, and we work in collaboration with actually other state single payer bills. Um, there are, I believe it's, we're up to 18 or 19 other states that have state single payer bills. New York and California are the closest to passing our bills. Um, Washington might be up there too. Um, and we work in tandem, all of us work in tandem with the National Medicare for All movement. Uh, and why we work on them simultaneously because we think that we strengthen each other's movements, right? Um, we also know that though there's a lot of momentum in the National Medicare for All movement, we are fairly certain that state by state is gonna be how it happens. Um, and New York and California are in places where we have the wealth to experiment with it also to, to do it well and to implement it in like full force. Um, and also other pieces of legislation like marriage equality, those happen state by state and then became federal fairly quickly, right? Um, and also Canada, they did it province by province. Um, so there's historic precedents for it, the momentum in all the movements and the political landscape in the movements. Um, we're all working together to pass at the state level and also the national level though, that they feed into each other. Thanks. I have another question. Assuming everything goes perfectly and the New York Health Act does get passed this year, um, how long will it take to implement it? And when could we actually expect to have a single payer system in place? Um, yes, that's a good question. So uh, the New York Health Act is intentionally does not have explicit financial mechanisms in the bill right now. And that's intentional because we want to pass it based on the human rights principles that was built upon. And so if the New York Health Act passes tomorrow, for example, um, it will still take one to two years to, before it actually starts ha like starts happening. And the one to two years is basically because our legislator only works for six months out of the year. So that's part of the reason why it's not a faster process. <laughs> um, but also because once the New York Health Act passes based on the human rights principles, then we start the year or two um, process of negotiating the explicit financial mechanisms, reimbursement rates, um, how it works with hospitals and things like that. Um, and so we, we anticipate that process to take about two years. This is Rebecca speaking again. Um, another question. Uh, for you, Ling, um, we had someone in the chat ask and, and say that um, I'm incredibly blessed to have insurance from my day job. Is there a way to leverage this to support the New York Health Act? Yes, um, I, I wanted to make an addition to the last question response that you know we're the the last mile is the hardest. This is how Senator Rivera puts it in in getting it passed this year in 2021. 
Um, but we also understand that that's actually after we pass this, this is when the hard part happens, right? Like what Jesse is talking about. This is when all the moneyed opposition will start to come out with all the money to the advertising with misinformation and half truths. Um, and so that's why we're taking this time, right? And everyone in this room to build this long-term movement. We don't just need to win the New York Health Act. We need to make sure we need to win it and then make sure it's implemented for the people that we intended it for. Um, and so people with insurance, how can you help? If people with great insurance, seemingly healthy, can get what they need. Um, there's so many ways to plug into the movement. Um, so there's those ways to plug into the movement to volunteer for the work and to like call your 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 legislator, um, but also people. What we know is that people with insurance, it, it's not just people without insurance that we're trying to help here. We know that there's a problem of underinsurance, and just one small, very concrete example of that is that 70% of bankruptcies are due to medical debt, and. Um, Oh, sorry, 60% of medical, 60% uh, of bankruptcies are due to medical debt. And 70% of those are people who have insurance. So we know that having insurance under this current fragmented for-profit racist system is, is the, you know, um, doesn't, still doesn't get us the care that we need. And our healthcare stories, like even, you know, they, they, they range, they range from very, from life and death, literally life and death, but also the simple story of like um, not of having anxiety and stress about calling or figuring out, you know, getting a doctor like that's in network or not out, not in network. Is this bill covered? Is that covered? Can I even go to the doctor? What does it cover? Like all those things. So it, yeah, your stories can range. Even if you feel like you don't have a healthcare story, we can help you find one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just want to plug again, this is Rebecca speaking, that we will have a storytelling workshop with Yuling and the Campaign for New York Health on April 21st at 6 p.m. Like Yuling just said, you may not know that you have a healthcare story. You know, I start hearing these things and then I realize that I have many healthcare stories. It just kind of takes a bit of going back and, and your voice matters and your stories are powerful. Let's see if we have one more question. This is Garnet speaking. Uh, I'll jump in with one more question for you, Ling, just because several of our speakers brought up the issue of mental health coverage. And you, you Ling, just uh, spoke about under insurance. And I think that's a huge barrier for a lot of people in accessing mental health coverage is that they may have insurance, but as Jay was saying in particular, you may not be able to find a therapist who accepts your insurance. And so I wonder if you could just say a little bit about how mental health care is treated specifically in the New York Health Act and how it's different from how our current health insurance system tends to treat mental health care. Um, yeah, I mean, so right now, prisons are the top mental health care providers in New York State. <laughs> like, that ain't right. <laughs> um, and also, like, right now, the majority of, the majority of, or like, more than 40% of people who are experiencing incarceration have mental health conditions. And a majority of people who are arrested um, at the time of their arrest, they are off of medications that they need, or they, they don't have, they can't get the mental health care that they need, or just general health care that they need, right? And it's just so related to um, so many arenas of our life and arenas of how profiteers and the carceral state and like our lack of housing, our, our lack of funding for public education and transportation. Um, yeah, the lack of mental health care, the lack of BIPOC therapists also, like for me, I, I want a BIPOC therapist. One, I can't even, I don't have mental health, right? It's not included in my insurance. Um, and two, then there's no mental th health therapist in network and with the handful that are, or the one that is, is not a BIPOC person and I want a BIPOC person, right? So 
under the New York Health Act, mental health and emotional health is considered part of your body, con considered part of your well-being. It's covered completely. Um, so I, I don't know. It's like just that simple. <laughs> and then that opens up space for us to have more BIPOC therapists, to have, to be able to focus in on other, like on more harm reduction, on like decarcerating our state um, and like more space to more directly address those, those issues. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's one of the key things, right, is that universal health care is actually much more simple. <laughs> no more uh, deductibles, premiums, everything is just covered. Um, so as Rebecca mentioned, we are collecting healthcare stories from arts workers. We're going to drop that link into the chat. So please share a story. Could be of a time that you lost your insurance coverage, struggled to get the care that you needed, had a battle with a health insurance company, or um, had a nasty surprise medical bill. So please share your stories with us and please come to our event if you feel like you have a story that you want to share, but you aren't quite sure where to start. We want to extend our deepest gratitude um, to all of you for tuning in and to all of our speakers. Um, yeah, I felt it tonight, your, your words, um, your honesty, just thank you. Um, we also want to thank Dance NYC and Abrams Art Center for making this event possible. Um, thank you also to League of Independent Theater and OK, Let's Unpack This for their support. Please continue to follow Dank and Dancers for New York Health Act on Instagram and Twitter to stay tuned uh, for past New York Health Act actions. Uh, we'll be on there sharing what you can do, sharing links. Um, and. Let's hope that we can we can pass it this year. Thank you. Thank you, Garnet and Rebecca. This is Candice coming back to you. Um, I'm so grateful for all of the work that Dank and you have put into this. I want to thank our speakers, Campbell, Garnet, Gustavo, Jay Bowie. Jesse Jehun, Mario Espinosa, Farah Sufant Forrest, Rebecca Margalik, and Yulin Kosu for sharing their expertise and their stories and their experiences with us here today. I want to thank our partners. Special thank you to our ASL interpreters from Synexus, Maria Cardosa and Stephanie Fain, and our live captioner, Cindy Kay from the Viscardi Center, and the moderators that have been keeping our chat Lively, Sarah and Megan. A few announcements before we go today. Um, we will post any resources shared today on the event webpage on our website, dance.nyc. I know we've been having issues with the YouTube chat. I think they think we're spamming. So we will get those to you for sure. We'll also send it in the follow-up email that we'll send next week. Um, and this conversation will be saved on YouTube as well. So you can come back to it if you want and or share it with other people who need it, who need to get this information. Please fill out our post event survey to let us know how we did and tell us how our programming can best serve you. Uh, fill out as well our Dance NYC COVID impact survey part three. Your input helps us to advocate on your behalf the funders and policymakers and get you what you need. And then lastly, if you are a black indigenous or person of color dancer, join us for Camille A. Brown's The Gathering happening April 20th through the 23rd and on May 5th. So as we close, let's continue to advocate for the health protections of arts workers everywhere and have a good night, New York dance. Bye everyone. <laughs>